Welcome back to SuperCloud 7 here on theCUBE. I'm Paul Gillen. We're talking all about platforms uh, in this series of interviews. And if you want to use a platform for inferencing, your choices are pretty much limited to the big cloud vendors, the big open source models, stuff that runs in large data centers. Our next guest believes that doesn't have to be the case. Matt Wright is the CEO and co-founder of GaiaNet, which is building a decentralized inferencing network uh, based on based on the blockchain, and uh, Matt, he's got about uh, 12 years of ex uh, 12 years of developer experience. He's been working with blockchain since 2016. Knows a lot about this market. Matt, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Let's start by hearing what GaiaNet is all about. What is it? Yeah, so you know we're taking you know the the best of open source and you know the um, you know power of of Web three. And open sourcing, uh, you know, developer tooling for building your own AI agent. Um, and so for us, we see decentralization not just in network or tokenization. We see that in, you know, barebone infrastructure. And so, you know, within our platform, like if you look under the hood, we're just taking open source LLMs that are already available, such as uh, Llama three that's you know provided by Meta. If you go to Hugging Face, there's six hundred thousand available, um, you know, small and large language models that you as a, as a developer could, you know, uh, implement into your, into your system. Uh, we basically enable you to take that and with our developer tools, you can deploy your own AI agent in, you know, just a few minutes. Uh, I think what's neat is, you know, as we start doing that at scale, we make it a lot easier for developers to think of unique integrations, unique plugins, things that make it customizable. And really what we're solving for here is, you know, within centralized AI uh, infrastructure, uh, there's a lot of vendor lock-in, there's censorship, there's uh, misaligned economics. Uh, we're basically enabling, you, enabling folks to take, uh, you know, take a system, package in their own data, run their own AI model, and decide to monetize services on top of that. Um, and and you were, we're leveraging Web3 to do a lot of the validation and monetization of those services. So obviously control is an advantage of, of your approach. Uh, what are some of the other advantages of the, the decentralized model? Yeah, so, um, you know, the biggest, the biggest is uh, privacy um, and, uh, you know, modular integrations uh, and monetization. So, you know, within, uh, you know, a, a bank or, you know, a large financial services company, if, if they're looking to build out their own AI or, you know, leverage, uh, you know, something like OpenAI, there's, you know, this risk of, you know, contributing your data into um, a more centralized ecosystem. We're basically enabling any Web3, or we're enabling any company to become an AI company. Um, so you can take our open source software and, uh, you know, plug in your vectorized uh, uh, embeddings and, and essentially run your own agent. Uh, whereas a lot of other approaches are more about, um, you know, having you work within their system, uh, within their platform, uh, we're enabling you to, you know, work with your your own engineers and maintain privacy and, and kind of, you know, create an AI agent ecosystem that works for your business. Why is blockchain critical to your model? Great question. <laughs> um, few reasons. Um, first and foremost is validating the the outputs uh, of the AI. So as we create a marketplace of nodes that are trained on specific context, uh, specific, you know, data set, and, you know, we're making that available to various developers or uh, what we call domains, like application layer, um, you, you need to validate that the outputs of these AIs are, are valid, that, you know, they're not, um, you know, trained on data that, uh, you know, you don't, think is, you know, putting out the incorrect outputs or, uh, you know, AI tokens. Um, from our perspective, we think that it's it's vital that we have Web3 to validate that, uh, that ecosystem and, you know, putting some sort of a stake or uh, collateral on behalf of, of that um, uh, computation is, is very important. Uh, the other reason is um, sharing compute power. So, Right now, in in centralized models, a lot of the compute is, uh, you know, put on a small group of people to decide on, you know, how to how to share those costs. You know, are you purchasing your own GPU? Are you, you know, 
trying uh, are you purchasing you know cloud credits or or uh, you know um, any sort of you know infrastructure to run your network with web3 you can actually have a, a you know uh, a network of participants that off offload a lot of those costs or balance all those costs and share with the community and I think the third part is um, you know through incentives so you know if you're contributing data and improving you know the model uh, with your own you know uh, knowledge base your own uh, data your own experiences you know you should be paid or compensated for those things and so and so you know it's really just those three verticals that we're seeing blockchain be uh, vital. Now, on your website, you have a long list already of, of models that are available. How easy is it for mm -hmm. someone to join your network to tap into one or more of those models and take advantage of them? Super easy. Yeah, as, a, as an end user, um, you can go and play around with any of the nodes that are hosted in, in their current state. Um, you know, we're hosting a few ourselves. Uh, we're running a few from our own GPU and, and also from, uh, you know, cloud instances. Um, if you're a developer or semi-technical, you can go to our GitHub. You can clone down um, the uh, you know the the code and and essentially run it from your command line in under two minutes. Um, if you're non-technical, we're looking to build tools that enable creators to you know uh, do this on their own. Um, but we have a a good suite of developer tools that you know help you um, you know vectorize some of your own data, whether it's you know some text file or robust database uh, we're helping you uh you know uh you know fine tune your model or you know have a rag enabled uh llm um but you know again like i mentioned earlier like there's already thousands hundreds of thousands of existing large language models and and um uh other size models uh kind of in the ecosystem we're basically just enabling uh you know folks to take what's already out there and uh, make it customizable for their specific use case or data. So what are you doing to uh, to recruit uh, partners to become part of your network? What's in it for them? Yeah, so a few things. Um, you know, if you're a developer and you're looking for an AI that, uh, you know, uh, the more data you contribute to it, it's not going to, you know, some other uh, party, you know, you're able to kind of, monetize or really own the IP of this data. Um, this is a way for you to actually, you know, create businesses on top of it, uh, on top of this AI. So whether it's, you know, you're an app developer or you're a dev shop, you're a, uh, enterprise or commercial enterprise, um, you can essentially build out use cases with, with our infrastructure and actually um, create, uh, you know, ways to monetize um, for the end user. Uh, who needs this? You know these kinds of insights or human readable format of of data. Um, the other reason would be you know um, just making sure that folks uh, you know are leveraging kind of the right infrastructure, and uh, you want to you know provide some services for building out these use cases. Um, but right now in the current system, you know you're really uh, you know you're really just kind of left with. Being, being a consumer instead of actually building a business on top of this infrastructure. And so you talked about how your partners can monetize the network. How is GaiaNet monetizing it? Yeah, so, you know, um, with token economics, you know, we're, we're very interested in, uh, you know, creating a, a, a robust um, tokenized ecosystem that, you know, validates these, um, uh, these nodes or these sources of data uh, we want to, you know, enable developers to build on that on that application level layer that I mentioned, um, and so we we see ways to either build more enterprise grade or premium features for for our developers. Uh, they're really our target market, um, and or you know there will be transaction fees, uh, you know, throughout the token economy, one way, shape, or form. Whether it's you know we build a, a premier service that. Uh, enables you to do payments in a different way or validate your nodes, um, you know, uh, in, a, in a more robust or, uh, you know, um, we're using like ZK proofs or like heavy encryption to like show that the node is actually, you know, uh, safe and valid and, and you know, is part of with the right resources, things like that, that are more like premium features uh, we would monetize, but the network itself, you know, is is 
decentralized. We want people to be incentivized to, you know, contribute their data, monetize, you know, their services. And, um, you know, we also lightly touched on this, but you, you don't even have to plug into our network. Uh, what's interesting is because this is open source, you can go to our GitHub, you can clone down the code and run it straight from your computer, <laughs> uh, from a GPU, CPU, uh, our model, uh, the models we use, or at least the platform that we we've enabled, uh, is quite lightweight. So you know, running your own AI in in um, an environment that is uh, attuned to you and in, in your ecosystem uh, is is uh, you know what's capable. So you mentioned validating the models. Uh, what do you do to vet the quality of the model? Be sure that you don't have you know rogue models that sneak in. Yeah, yeah, we're. Um, so we're thinking through a few ideas right now. Uh, right now, we're we're heads down on the on the core infrastructure. Um, we're now moving into the Web three space, where you know now there's a need to uh, you know validate that the the data source is either you know we have proof of inference, so you can you know run encryption algorithms that uh, enforce that you know the data was actually uh, or the the uh, model is actually trained on the data that it says it was. And there could be some cryptographic games that help kind of uh, keep keep that network honest. There's also um, something we're working on with a partner that's like proof of response. And so, thinking through, you know, was the output of the of the model actually uh, valuable to the to the paying customer? And uh, again, we're kind of thinking through those technical hurdles. That's that's next on our list. But um, you know. Right now, in its core infrastructure, we're trying to make it frictionless for developers to just get started and run their own their own agent. And the next step from that is, you know, naturally the developer is thinking, okay, now I have you know this cool package data. I have it, you know, I have my own AI, and it's I want to make it available to a network. Now, how do I get paid? You know, and and so for for someone to want to pay uh, for that service, um, they're going to want to know that you know that node is is going to give them uh the right output or you know it's it's not worth your 20 bucks a month or whatever that ends up being at some point we we haven't really wrapped our heads around what the that end user experience uh, you're still early on but you've already got a partnership with uh ucal berkeley uh, tell us about how they're going to be putting your technology to work and how is that sort of an example of how guy and might work in other scenarios yeah absolutely um so our chief scientist, uh, he's a professor at UC Berkeley, uh, twenty-year tenured professor in the machine learning uh, uh, kind of innovation side of, of UC Berkeley, um, and he had an interesting challenge where, you know, he he's got about twenty PhDs that um, have consistent questions or uh, want to collaborate with him on on you know past curriculum or past papers. And, you know, he didn't have the bandwidth to bring in um, a team of teaching assistants. And so he wanted to start building that out through a, an autonomous agent. And so, um, you know, with our infrastructure, with, uh, you know, the dev tools that we, we have available and the large language models that, again, are open source, he's been training uh, this AI on, on his past curriculum for the, you know, past 20 years. And, and uh any papers that, you know, he's kind of shared with his class, any materials, any, um, you know, feedbacks he's had with students, forums, et cetera, um, all that's in, in a node. And so he's made it available to uh, his students and uh, I believe like adjacent faculty. And now he's got almost a digital twin of, of himself. Uh, and, you know, since he's, you know, he owns kind of the IP that, he's been creating for this amount of years uh, over time, what he's looking to do is, is to be able to monetize that. So imagine if, you know, at some point he can, one of his students can co-author a paper verifying that, you know, this was the digital twin version that, uh, you know, produced some of those, those uh, outputs. Um, yeah, it's been a quite an interesting case study, uh, but yeah, very exciting. And one of the strengths of your network is that you leverage small language models. We hear a lot about LLMs, but what is the value of small language models? What what do people need to know about them? Yeah, I think from the context of GuyNet, um, you know, when there's a lot of talk around large language models and AGI and, you know, very heavy, um, you know, uh, instances where we're training these models on the entire 
scope of the internet. Um, and, you know, the context gets a bit um, vague at times. Uh, we, you know, we have hallucinations because like the, the technology has hallucinations because it's not, um, you know, trained to a specific, uh, you know, uh, data set or, or uh, prompt. And it takes time to really build up the model on that specific context. Um, out of the box, like the LLMs that we work with are, um, you know, not uh, fine-tuned or RAG-enabled. And so we, we again, have these developer tools that allow for someone to, uh, you know, train a node on a very specific set of data. And, you know, that doesn't require a large language model in all times, uh, in all cases. Uh, it could be a small language model that just solves a very finite task or some sort of a recurring task that doesn't require, um, you know, uh, again, this massive payload or, or throughput, it, it really can work lean. And I think the future of that is, you know, when we start having language models running our, on our, you know, mobile phones or on, you know, smaller devices, um, you know, on uh, uh, devices that require like a lower latency, uh, there's some really cool use case and applications that open up uh, versus needing, you know, uh, an immense amount of uh, internet or, or throughput to uh, run a run a large language model. So, are you a competitor to the LLM hosting providers, or uh, are you just another outlet, another uh, distribution mechanism for them? No, I, I, great question. I I think we have a lot to learn from like everyone in the space right now. Like, first of all, we're so early, um, but from you know the large language model providers, you know, out the gate, you know, you have folks like. Meta, who are contributing uh, Llama three and you know the Llama suite to open source, and um, without without their contribution open source, you know we wouldn't be able to do you know what we're doing. Um, and so we're big proponents of of open source software. I spent time in my career in open source. Uh, same with our head of engineering um, and co founders. And so we're you know we're really bullish on on you know opening up uh, you know uh, large language models, small language models. Um, AI learnings uh, with the community. I think the the one conflict that comes about is you know with you know uh, projects like like OpenAI, for example. Um, you know there might be an opportunity where you know someone might choose our API over OpenAI because you know there's a more specific use case they can uh, leverage. But in all, like I use OpenAI on a daily basis, like ChatGPT. Like I don't think I ever will stop using it. Um, I think in the future, we're all going to have various uh, suites of AI applications and, and uh, utilities. The website is GaiaNet.ai. Go check it out. Look at some of the models that they have available. There's a long list there and instructions for how to plug in. Uh, uh, Matt, a very innovative approach to, uh, to this fledgling area and um, we wish you all the best. We hope we'll see you back again on theCUBE. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. Matt Wright, CEO and co-founder of GaiaNet. Thanks for joining us for this segment of SuperCloud 7. I'm Paul Gillen, we'll be right back.